In this lesson, we're going to talk briefly about how orders are executed and how they flow through the process on the New York Mercantile Exchange. Um, as we mentioned in the NYMEX lesson, that these contracts are legally binding obligations to make or take uh, delivery of the various commodities at the specific location. So in other words, to make sure everything is complied with according to the agreements, then we have to walk through and certain things uh, conditions have to be met. Now here's an example of a 12-month strip. I mentioned that strips are just multiple uh, pricing months, but you can get an average price. So you can see here I took um, a one-year strip starting with June of 2015. And at the bottom of the last column, you see there that the strip price is approximately $3.20. So we're going to use this as an example and walk through how this gets executed. So we see here that the uh, natural gas prices on the 12-month strip are approximately $3.20. There's a producer of natural gas who's interested in selling uh, some of the natural gas, and, and they like this price. So they're going to call either some energy trading company that they do business with, or perhaps they have a financial broker who can actually execute contracts on the floor of the New York Mercantile Exchange or electronically. So they tell them basically that they would be interested in locking in that strip price average of 320 or hopefully even better. So now the trader or the broker calls the NYMEX floor to establish a bid and offer quotation. Okay, remember there are buyers and sellers in the market. So the 320 may not be there right at the moment, but they're going to go find out what the uh, prices are, you know, what's the price that the market is willing to purchase at and what's the price at which the market is willing to sell. We call that a bid-ask spread or a two-way. Now the trader or broker gets the quote and they repeat it back to the customer. The producer decides that, okay, the market is somewhere in that 320. So the producer says that, you know, he or she would like to lock in a price of 320 or better for the 12-month strip for 10,000 MMBTs a day. Again, remember, that represents one contract a day for this entire month. So in essence, they're going to be selling, you know, 365 contracts. The trader now takes the order from the producer and places the order with the phone clerk on the floor of the NYMEX. Now keep in mind, these are legally binding obligations for all parties. So the producer has just committed. They've said, go ahead and enter into these contracts on my behalf. And they all acknowledge that they are legally bound to perform under these contracts. Okay, the phone clerk then, they'll have a ticket and they'll stamp it. Okay, with the time that the order received from that fixed price desk from the trader. The phone clerk then will hand the ticket to the, uh, with the order on it to their broker in the natural gas trading pit. So now what happens is the broker offers the 12-month strip price into the market at the 320. Okay, so again, keep in mind, the producer sells in the financial market since they have the production and the need of market. This is a key to hedging. So in other words, the producer has the natural gas. So what is it they need when they go to the NYMEX? They need a market. They need a price and they need a market for it. So their broker is offering this out. Okay, now another broker who has received a buy order from their customer decides to lift the offer. And that's what we call it, lifting the offer on the 12-month strip at 320. So again, in order for the producer to be able to find a market, there has to be a buyer. And again, if we talk about there, for every seller, there has to be a buyer and vice versa. It's a zero-sum game. Okay, now the, the broker representing the producer hands the order, now filled back to the phone clerk. So the phone clerk is going to timestamp that ticket once more to verify when the order was completed. So they have a timestamp that shows when they received the order over the phone and a timestamp that shows when the order was basically consummated in the pits. The phone clerk calls back the trader or the financial broker who represents the producer. The trader broker receives what we call the fill from the floor of the NYMEX. Okay, in other words, the order was filled. And they repeat the fill verbally to ensure that there's no errors. The trader broker then passes along the completed order to the producer. So the trader broker then says to the producers, okay, you know, you, you're done. We got that done for you on the NYMEX. So the producer is now what we call hedged if natural gas is de prices decline below 320 on the 12 month strip. Okay. That's it. If prices fall, they're locked in at 320, but they have no ups, uh, upside. So in other words, if prices go higher than that, then they can't reap any benefit from that. However, the decision has to be made earlier on that the producer is okay with 320. All right? They're now obligated to deliver 10,000 MMBTUs a day on a firm basis at the Henry Hub every day for the next 12 months. Okay? Now, if the above transaction was conducted on electronic trading platform, such as NYMEX's Globex, the trader broker would merely hit the bid or lift the offer with a keystroke. 
In other words, they'd be sitting in front of a, a computer panel, and they'd be looking at the trades on Globex, and they would put the offer out there, and then someone, you know, would basically lift that offer. Or if they saw a, a bid out there already for 320, they would go ahead and and hit the button and execute that, or hit the bid as we call it. We need to talk for a little bit about high frequency trading because this has influenced the market in a big, big way over the last few years. Okay, and this is basically the instantaneous electronic execution of futures contracts with the use of supercomputers. Okay, there are complicated algorithms that determine the buy and sell prices. High volume orders are executed literally in nanoseconds. So in other words, the computer really isn't concerned too much about fundamental factors, the, the typical supply and demand things that go on um, outside of the exchange. They just want price movement, and they will lock in certain prices. And if the price moves upward, they'll buy some contracts. If the price moves downward, they'll buy some contracts. If they lose money, they'll flip immediately and go into the position that, that makes them money. And they are trading hundreds of thousands of contracts a day, and they're tied directly to the electronic exchanges, and so they are literally executing in nanoseconds. Okay, one of the you know one of the good things I guess we could say about this is that they add liquidity. In other words, the more participants and the more volume that trades on the exchange, the greater the likelihood that the commercial interests, again the physical uh, parties who are buying and selling actual commodity in the NYMEX, the better the odds are that they'll get a price and volume out there that they need. However, this uh, substantial increase in trading volatility and the speed with which these high-frequency trading companies and their computers um, execute orders has increased the volatility in the marketplace substantially. And when we talk about volatility, we talk about not only how quickly prices change, but the magnitude of the price change. You know, we see things in the crude oil markets these days even where you can move $3 in a day, and that, that's just, you know, huge. Um, natural gas markets could move 40 or 50 cents in a day, and that's a pretty good movement as well. So it's not only how fast prices are moving, but it's the magnitude of the change, and that's what we call volatility. And the HFT traders have increased volatility dramatically. And then the other question becomes, is it unfair? Do they have an unfair advantage over others? Well, certainly they do, because they are executing orders, buy and sell orders, thousands of contracts uh, at a time in literally nanoseconds. It's almost as if the other people, you know, who want to trade or do any business on the NYMEX, they're just bystanders. So it has yet to be seen if any regulations, such as Dodd-Frank or others, will be imposed upon the uh, high-frequency traders. But we need to know that they're out there, because they do. When you know that they're out there and you see movement in pricing, it doesn't quite make sense based on fundamental circumstances, um, you can almost bet that it's uh, the result of these computers triggering trades.